Bigger than ever, it's the unofficial 40 from Soonerscoop.com. Now, here's the entire Soonerscoop crew, Carrie, Josh, Eddie, and Bob. All right, we are back. It is the unofficial 40 podcast right here on Soonerscoop.com podcast. Uh, we have, uh, it's the original three, amigo, me, uh, three amigos, I can't even say it, uh, Josh McQuiston, Eddie Radosevich, Carrie Murdoch, we've had... Disaster to start the day. Uh, George Stoya's car broke down on him. Well, I we say that it is. He's suspended after his performance on the Eskridge <laughs> Lexus post game show. Uh, we thought maybe it's you like know, a Lincoln a Riley suspension, a, though. He could walk in at any time. <laughs> yeah, after the first series, he'll be back. Uh, yeah, the first play. No, I mean, it was not there a first play. Was that well? It was a at, series, but Kyler. Took it 68, 70 but yards. But wasn't that the end? Didn't, didn't Baker come back, or did they let him finish that drive? Uh, it was well, they, West Virginia. Yeah, they scored. Yeah, ironically. Yeah, ironically. They scored, and then he came back in the next series. So the second that series. That was after the KU ball grabbing, I believe. Which, yes. To be fair, was fairly miraculous after he uh, seemingly died in the pregame. With yeah. The jersey Orlando, yeah, the no, jersey. we talked to Orlando Brown about that out at the Baker, uh, <laughs> the, go- the the top golf thing. Yeah. What? Uh, whose jersey it was, was it? Uh, it was another offensive lineman. Yeah, it was the tackle from Louisiana. Uh, we always forget his name. He did the. Ely? Yeah, Adrian yeah, Adrian Ealy. Adrian Ealy. Uh-huh. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. He, for some reason, he had a Baker Mayfield I, jersey. Well, I think it was for his child, uh, Adrian Ealy's kid. Oh, okay. I think yeah. that 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 was, was the a big story. Baker is fan. like, yeah, and they he had a child, or I don't think it was a baby, a toddler, at the time. maybe. Yeah, and I think that jersey was tiny. Yeah, no, it was. It's but one it of really the greatest was, moments really, in Scoop <laughs> HD history. Really well, the greatest moment is definitely the pre Baylor game. Oh, yeah, with Baker. You forgot who your dad yeah, yeah, yeah. was. Yeah, that was great. I did notice that uh, somebody asked him about that on a national show, and he said something about it was a cameraman that, you know, got well, He didn't give me credit. He didn't he give you me, credit. No. What a son of a bitch. Who did the Bucks play this week? I'm going to bet against him. <laughs> <laughs> might be a good. Might be a Baker, good, leave uh, more time on the clock this week, all right? Or, or, or take don't, more yeah, time don't off t- the clock. Don't leave any time on the clock. My God. I mean,. That we were all from, watching that game together, I think, because you were, yeah. you were you you had it. You were in Houston, so they were showing it there. That went from uh, the uh, like the lows of the weekend. I was like, finally, I'm God, gonna get a could that have been football, a worse f-ing weekend for football? A, a football weekend that maybe I can be happy about. And uh, no, they, the Bucks defense had other ideas. Although C.J. Stroud's unbelievable, uh, what he's been able to do as a rookie. Four seventy, wasn't fantastic. it? Four seventy five. Four seventy and five touchdowns. Yeah, With basically the, one receiver. The reality that 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 he was ahead of Anthony Richardson and the Colts are going to have to f- face him for the foreseeable future is not really something I'm looking forward to. He looks like he's going to be a monster. D'Amico Ryan's really good as well. He's done a hell of yeah. a job. That I mean, because Houston, they're all young. It's just kind of there. Well, and Bad also, division. also uh, Bob Prisbillo, uh, I know a lot, thousands of people were looking forward to some basketball talk today. Uh, the hell he, they were. He sent us a message saying that he'd been at urgent care. I guess his, uh, I, well, Bob doesn't like us putting his business out there. Uh, you know, he's, his family's sick, so he walks in here. He sounded terrible. Yeah, they've been battling it. He, he played uh, under the weather on Saturday. I, I'm Stillwater. not putting up with that shit. I told him to go home. You're not making me sick. I thought it was weird that you still make us wear masks in the office. <laughs> uh, it can never be too. You have to show your um, you have to show your COVID card when you walk in. The I don't say that. I he made us say choose that... between Hamas and uh, Israel as well. You have to state who you're supporting and then put and on then the mask. You're allowed to come into the building. Uh, by the way, um, so yeah, I don't know if George is going to be able to make it. It, it. His car broke down. He's at the shop right now. He's. He's being fawned over apparently by a YouTube fan, uh, so maybe they won't. Very good. Off. Are you, uh, Josh? You seem like a guy that's been ripped off by mechanics in the past. It's one of those things. I'm sure that I have. At I least am, Tiffany I, has. I am, before you married, were yeah. married. I 
I would honestly be a little surprised because Tiffany in another life could have absolutely been a reporter because she asked every question that is humanly possible to think about. Like, and she wants to know, why are you doing this? And she's Googling and reading like, well, I would, you know, they say here, you should do this. Like, she's very direct and like, she's very much not afraid to ask a question. So I, I think the odds are more likely I've been ripped off because I'm one of those guys who's just like, okay, if you say so, man, like, yeah. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm the exact same I'm way. The, I'm, t- I'm on Team Tiffany because, like, when the epoxy guy came here and he told me, like, oh, you've got cracks, it's going to be an extra $300 uh, because the, the solution is very expensive. I mean, they left, and I just took pictures and went and looked up how much the stuff was online, and I knew he was ripping me off. Well, that entire operation looked a little... Uh, oh, my God. Well, it, first it, off... It, I, they looked like somebody that might be in the business of ripping people off. Yes, very much so. He didn't do an ounce of work. He had his stepson and his friend do it basically anyway uh that's the only time we've been ripped off by a contractor so far so um anyway now you can't even get one to come that there's nobody nobody's working uh our og guy got something i don't know <laughs> yeah, deported that, that or, got deported yeah i don't know i don't know what happened there he just ghosted us i, I miss him i miss uh Tereso. Uh, so anyway, it's the uh, three amigos. We're here awaiting West Virginia. You've had your YouTube shows. Uh, yeah, I, I was killed on the board for being the voice of reason on the Eskridge Lexus post game pod. Uh, they just wanted. I don't. We never really asked Josh's opinion of what he thought. Yeah, Bedlam go. <laughs> Is it was oh. it the disaster that we thought it was? You know. You go back through the idiot, and I thought, and I thought we were all pretty honest. The Kansas game, I, I thought a lot of that fell on one person's shoulders. And I, I don't think the fans are terribly wrong in who Fair. they took issue with there. Against Oklahoma State, that's not what I saw as much. I'm not saying that there weren't some play calls that I found strange or out of place, and I I, I hate all the lateral stuff. Um, I it, it has a place. I just I don't think there should be as much of it as we see uh day in and you know game in and game out but guys i saw a lot of there were plays there to be made on the um the the play before drake stoops's pi there is a play that if nick anderson reads the block right and he picks up who he's supposed to pick up dillian gabriel could probably score going left and gavin sawchuk could score going right if he gives to gavin sawchuk like that it's blocked up beautifully either direction it's just whatever he wants to read nick and gabriel keeps anderson goes to the wrong block or he goes to try to pick up colin oliver and oliver kind of nukes the play and the whole thing just kind of blows up in ou's face so it's like there was there was a lot of mental errors and i i know people look at the numbers i don't think dylan gabriel played particularly well yeah i mean i know that uh yeah. I, i'll just say this i mean there were throws that should have been, you know, caught. I mean, the Nick Anderson, went down. like he, I know oh, yeah. you probably saw the same thing I did. He started stumbling. It was like a turf monster got him as the ball was getting there. And you know how that goes. Like you lose track of the ball. Your, you know, your eyes aren't, you know, steady anymore. And he just never could. I haven't put the video see. out. My Gundy tripped him <laughs> is what I saw. <laughs> and the, the officials never. He was out near anything. the numbers. Why, why yeah. not go for the big 12 ref tripped him? I, I think I saw that too. I'll put out the video later today. And look, I understand like the whole Facebook thing. It, it's just what it is where people blame the refs for stealing the game from OU. I don't think anybody... On, Scoop doesn't really have those discussions. I mean, our fans, they have the fire everyone discussions more than probably Facebook yes. does. Uh, but I don't think our, you know, our subscribers are really that into the conspiracy. Like, everybody kind of knows, like, you're screwed if you're OU or Texas this yeah. year. The refs are going to do nothing to help you. It's not a conspiracy. It's just fact. I mean, they, you just have to understand that going in. Both can be true in that they got hosed. I yeah. mean, Drake got tackled in the end zone. And the Vickers thing, if you play it back and forth, it should have been a no call. If if anything, a no call. If You're saying maybe even offensive. Yeah, passing, I mean, yeah. I think that like it looks like from uh, at least like Dylan Buckingham's video, it looks like he gets shoved down, but... With that said, as bad as the officiating was, I don't know if you can necessarily just point to that and say, oh, that's the reason Oklahoma lost. I right. mean, the penalties right. uh, on top of the turnovers, There's so on much... top of the play call, you just you didn't play good enough to get the benefit of the doubt that, oh, if you can just get a call here, you win the game. There's so many 
ways that OU self-destructed on yeah, top of the I mean, the, the discipline and turnovers is what I keep going back to over the last two weeks. The 19 penalties is just, it's, it shouldn't happen. Like I don't fall six false starts at the last two weeks four from the wide receiver unit is just, it's crazy to me. You know, we do so much stuff during the week now. Like I can't remember, like if we said this at some point, if it was something you and George talked about, if something Gabe and Teddy talked about on their podcast. But the one thing that I've heard this week where I was like light bulb over my head went on is with all the, the procedure penalties on OU, like, Going fast all the time, to me, is part of what's the problem with, with the procedural penalties. Because you're going up to the line, you're going fast. When they have to you know, sit there and, and stand on the line, and the receivers even included, uh, like it's just like lining up offsides against Kansas, uh, although that was a defensive thing. But we've had, I think, who was it in the Oklahoma State game? Didn't they have a receiver line up offsides? Uh, they well, they had Farouk, Farouk, Farouk like Farouk. up off sides. Okay, he was so it's like it's almost like they rush to get there and they're not they're not they're just mindless. It's like get to the line, snap it, get to the line, snap it. When they get to the line and they have to change the call or there's an audible or something, it's like they can't just sit still because they're not used to doing that. Well, and, and the one on Farouk, you can see him like he catches a ball on a third down, um, kind of sneaks inside. Well because of all the traffic, all the bodies around him, he can't see the call from the sidelines. So you see him shuffling like he's waving his arms like, I can't see it, I can't see it. And then he realizes they're going to go. And so he tries to get down and get into position, but Gabriel calls it before. Like, uh, how how are they not looking around and saying, okay, we, we've got 11 ready here. Like, well, you know, that's going to take you an extra half a second. Check it before you run it, and then you've, you've probably got a valid play. So... I, but I, guys, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And everybody knows I hate the oh the referees did it. Like Drake Soup's terrible call. The Macari Vickers thing, I I thought it was strange that the in all, in the in studio guy was immediately like, oh yeah, he ran it. He he disrupted his route and ran into him on his route. I was like, okay, I didn't. Let's see get rid. That, let's but. get rid of the studio officials. I mean, they're terrible. They they never get it right. Yeah. They they don't offer insight. It's just like. You know the thing at Kansas, the guy said it was an incomplete pass when the you know he came out of bounds, and then uh, it turns out like and the rules you know ab about you know how things happen like they don't always know the rules or the rules have changed and they haven't kept up with them. I just they're not adding anything to me because I'm at home now watching it on TV for the first time all season, and other than just too many commercials, which. By the way, college football fans need to revolt. I mean, they need to revolt against all the commercials. Like, I understand college football has sold their soul, but somehow fans have to get the message to the networks. The, the, the number of commercials is just out of control. Did you and see the number of breaks in the game? Did you see the uh, Terry McCauley explanation? I know that you're shitting on the uh, officiating people that come in and do the <laughs> studio stuff, but he actually gave a very like it's a very long answer uh, on Twitter, just as far as like rotations for officials mm -hmm. and how basically there were three guys that were out of position on the Drake Stoops thing. I mean, I'm not going to read it because oh, wow. it's extremely long, but basically the two guys, the back judge and the side judge completely bungled uh, the funda position. like fundamentals and mechanics of where they needed to be to be able to see uh, Drake getting tackled. But with all that said, like it obviously so they're not crooked. They're just lazy. Yeah. That's what he 100%, said. One hundred percent, basically, and I, you know, well, it just it, to say that that one play made Oklahoma lose the game. It's certainly one of the bigger missed calls in recent memory. But they just didn't play well enough. You should have never been in that position. The five uh, possessions in the third quarter that you had a chance to separate, which I know George is writing about. Uh, I think today or tomorrow. Tomorrow. Uh, just it, it, Oklahoma's inability to move the football in major key spots and take advantage of whether it be a Kansas or uh, Oklahoma State or even Texas to a certain extent. That game should have never had to come down to what it was. Uh, it hurts them. Yeah, guys, I mean, it's 14-17. OU comes up with that first fourth down stop, drives down the field, takes the lead for the first time all day. Then they get the next series, they get another fourth down stop near, near midfield. Can't do anything with it. Punt the ball away. They get they get it back again later on the next. I think it's the ensuing drive from I think three in a row was two fourth downs and then the Billy Bowman interception to start the fourth quarter. 
you don't you got seven points out of three defensive turnovers. Like, no, that's on you. That game should have been at least, and I mean at least 31-17 before OSU ever really got rolling in the fourth quarter. Like that it should have that the game should have been pretty much dead with the way OU's defense was playing in the second half. Look, I think we have some issues with um some of the way things are being handled, you know, by Brent in terms of you know, not letting us talk to Jeff Levy during the week anymore. Uh, but it's like every time these guys are talking right now, they're saying something bad. Like the the thing after the game that George tweeted out where Levy, you know, talked about, you know, Drake had to get deeper on his route. Um, but he also took blame for it. And then, you know, yesterday at the press conference when, you know, all George was doing was asking – Brent, what he meant by you know having a Rolodex of plays on his coach's show the night before, he got very defensive uh, and said he was moving on to West Virginia. Uh, but he also went on to say how many great things the offense does, has done this year, where they rank in statistical categories. And it's one of those things, like, that's the worst thing you could do, Brent, because people can see they're not dumb. They, they know that you're not scoring when you're up by seven points. Like, you cannot, you have not, you have failed to extend leads, which win games, and that's complimentary football. Like, you can have great sets. You can be the top scoring offense in the league. But if you don't do it when it matters most, that's not winning football. That, I mean, that's a part of it, too. Yeah, uh, again, I I don't understand. Like the the people, there are fans. It's so, and this is I, I get it. This is the world we live in. Like there is a set of fans who are like ask the tough questions, and then when you ask, what I don't even think was a tough question. It wasn't like he was putting Brent's feet to the fire or anything. He was asking him to clarify something he said. Like, it, and Brent said it unprovoked. Like he was in the middle of a conversation and kind of threw that Rolodex comment out there. And you're like, well, what does that mean? Like, does that, th- did you take issue with it? Did you, I mean, like, expand on that Well, a it makes bit. him look like he doesn't have it's... control of his, his team, too. Yeah. Like, if he's taking issue I... with a, a final play in the game on offense the day after, like, dude, you got to be involved in that. Like, that's, that's your job is to make the, you're the head coach. It's your job to make the game deciding calls when it's on the line. Guys, I, I went looking at because I this is something I felt because Gary, you and I talked about this a while ago. Like my belief that it's really hard to be a play caller, offensively or defensively, anymore with all that is asked of head coaches. Like I, I'm not saying Brent's alone in this. It's really hard to do. Nick Saban, Kirby Smart, they don't call their own plays, and we know they're great defensive play callers. Very much of Brent's, you know, echelon. Like Brent's a great one. I get it. But you go back and look at the national title winning head coaches. Since Tom Osborne in like 1997 or not, no, it was, um, it wasn't even Tom Osborne because it was Solich was his OC. Um, I, I like there's three in the last 30 years and one since like 2010. And it was Jimbo Fisher, who I don't think you want to be the one to emulate like that. <laughs> there, there is something to that, that you're like, I, I think, cause guys, I showed it during the Monday morning idiot. I, I know I talked to you guys about it. There's a clip right before the, right after the punt, OSU's final punt. OU's about to take over the ball on that last drive. And Brent is there with his headphones off talking to uh, Kendall Dolby. He's, and, and he's doing his job as a defensive coordinator, which we all know he pretty much is. And you see Matt Wells pull his down, and he says something in there, and there's clearly a conversation going on you know, amongst Jeff Levy and Matt Wells and everybody else. He can't hear any of it. He doesn't eat like there's no way he can even hear the conversation. And I know he ceded some of that control, but man, you're the head coach. That buck stops with you. And for him to come and say that in the coach's thing, you're like, well, you could have had a hand in that. You, you, I, who knows? Like, I'm again, it's probably making too much out of too little, but this isn't something I'm like just new to this idea. I, I just don't love a play caller as a head coach. I, I think it has inherent problems. I don't think it's you know the reason that they've lost two games. No. I, 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 I would blame it more on the fact that the offense is not doing its job up to the level of the defense. And, and I don't take issue with Brent basically taking over as the D.C. I mean, we all knew he was the defensive coordinator last year. Uh, then, you know, he said it in the offseason. I think it was his initial press conference that 
he knew he had to be more involved in the defense, and he is, but that's what this team needs right now. Until, until they build a group of 11 guys that are out there knowing exactly what they're doing and what the other guys should be doing and what their backup should be doing, like, they need that. They, I mean, I, I get that. For the program, it's the best choice right now. Now, if you go 10-2 and two and finish it off, you can say, okay, they're building something, and now they're, they're recruiting, and uh, they're bringing in all this new talent, and, and it's going to get there eventually. I, I think even if they lost another game, you're still in a good direction. I, and I don't think you need to fire mm. Jeff Levy, but I think Levy has to learn just like Brent's learning. I mean, everybody's learning together in this deal. It would be really bad if they can't finish this thing out, though, and win these final three games. And I mean, West Virginia is not an easy win. No, it's a, it's a big game. I mean, I, they certainly can't show up and play the way that they have the last two weeks and win. And and especially if you're going to turn the ball over three times like they have in each of the past two games. Well, what were you telling me yesterday? Like you said, there was a moment on the sideline in the TCU game where where um, somebody TCU. was telling me that that Kendall Bryles was getting yelled at by Sonny Dykes. Oh no, we were just talking about it on the radio how it's it's just really interesting how TCU's offensive woes or whatever they're going through. And the quarterback situation is completely different because they're having to start a true freshman. But it's just interesting from like a play calling standpoint, how Kendall Bryles and Jeff Levy, who were brother-in-law, share the, you know, the the relationship with Art Bryles. And they're trying to do something similar of the same ilk, I guess, of what Art Bryles was doing. And it just seems like they're both lost at calling plays at times uh, without the direction of the mastermind behind yeah. all of it. Yeah. Well, and even at Ole Miss, we've talked about this. Uh, you know, Levy had Lane Kiffin. Yeah. And when he was at, you know, he's at Central Florida, he not only had Kendall Bryles, but he had Josh Heupel. It's almost, it, it, and I know that we feel, I feel like it's uh, just a broken record as far as coming in here every week and saying like, they they have big plays and then they back it up with just some of the most asinine either play calling or execution that you could even possibly think. Like the 49-yarder to Nick Anderson, you get out of a third and long and then you're trying to direct snap to Javante Barnes. Like, I just, just keep doing what you're doing. When you say like... But then the, like the, the Drake Stoops touchdown uh, in the second quarter mm-hmm. or at second or third quarter... What a great play call. He was wide open, comes yeah. out of the backfield. It, it was. It's just like, why can't you do shit like that every time? And well, Josh, I know that's I, like I, so easy. I know you said say. Dylan didn't really have a good game, but if you think the, of the big third downs that he picked up throughout that game, they're not even in it without those. And it was because oh, no. it was because he got put in, you know, bad positions mm-hmm. with maybe a call that didn't work here or there, or, you know, the trying to run a little too much or whatever. But like he had a lot of not third and medium or third and shorts, but third and longs that he converted in that game. They had a bunch of second and shorts. He did. Just real quick, they had a bunch of second and shorts too that all of a sudden become second and 10 because somebody jumps off sides. Like you pick up five yards on first down, you think you're rolling and then false start and you're having to move back or second and six that becomes a second and 11 because a wide receiver jumps. Go ahead, By the way, before we do that, uh, I want to get Josh's uh, eyes on that uh, as well, but we'll remind you it's the enjoy uh, vision, fresh perspective, look around and, uh, you know, we're going to wrap up the Oklahoma State talk here pretty quick, but um, Eddie, I will say I want to give a shout out to Dylan Buckingham uh, yeah. in this segment because I thought what he did after the game, and he also got the, the he also got the call inside, which you you kicked yourself after you saw it because you're like I was pointing in that direction. Yeah, I, I came just, up right. I, you didn't expect Brent Venables to get a personal foul though after that. Well, no, I was just completely shocked. I was shocked that they had thrown a flag, and then I was shocked that they uh, gave Brent the quick. I like I saw it in real time. I had my camera down to the side, and I was like, shit, I probably should have been recording that. <laughs> but I what I really want to give Dylan credit for is he followed Trace Ford around after the game was. Oh over. yeah. Uh, just tailed him to see what happened and the players that were coming up to him. And like, it was really funny because he and Mike Gundy were walking towards each other and it was like they both just veered off. And I think maybe they shared a little glance, but uh, Mike Gundy, 
he might need to go to enjoy if you know he meant to say something to Trace Ford because he totally missed him and walked right by. Since going to enjoy Vision to have LASIK, Saturday was the first time that I just wish they would have put bleach in my eyes. But Enjoy Vision is the best laser vision center in Oklahoma City. It's not even close. The combination of mind-blowing technology, experienced eyeball surgeons, and exceptional patient care was life-changing for me. What they're doing for the unofficial 40 listeners, giving $400 off of LASIK, all you got to do is go to enjoywithme.com. That is the letter in J-O-Y with me.com and use the promo code U40 for $400 off of LASIK. Enjoy vision. This is where you lace it. All right. And now, Josh, uh, back to I know what you want to say. I wanted to give you your time. But we were talking about the, the big plays that, that Dylan was making on third downs. It really kept him in the game. Sure. And I, and don't get me wrong. Like, he's making the throws. And I, I don't want to be like, oh, he he didn't have a good game. Like, I, I probably overstated that. I, I think he left a lot out there, I guess, mm-hmm. would be the way I would say that. Um, the deep balls to Farouk. Um, now, it begs the question: Why are why is Farouk your deep guy? That that's not his game. Like that's not where he's best. Now he made an incredible catch on the one. Uh, there, there's no doubt while while being interfered with. But again, that uh, guys, we talk about this every week. The personnel decisions are hard to explain. They don't marry well to what's being called. And I get that when you're doing hurry up, like it's not always going to be perfect. I I really do understand. But there's just stuff that doesn't make sense. But the guy that I, I've got to say that I thought, you know, I did. I thought in during the game watching him, I thought he played well. Watching him through the Monday morning idiot, Drake Stoops. Oklahoma State had no answers for Drake Stoops. He he played of his career. maybe the best game of his career. Yeah, he was unbelievably good. It's unfortunate that it probably gets overshadowed because of the loss and because of the way that the offense, uh, in essence, failed at the end of the game, but. And, and that's the thing. It's like, I would have to go back and look on the Brennan Thompson drop on fourth and five was Drake Stoops in the game. And why aren't they having him run that route that you know is a sh- sure-handed guy that's going to give you the opportunity? It's, it's, it's little things like that. And you go back to even the final drive against Kansas when you don't have Nick Anderson out on the field. Like, is that where you know, trying to go fast and moving is going to hurt you more times than it's going to help you. Uh, Cause I mean, guys, so much of what you watch, like, you know, people who say, Oh, the play calling, the play calling. My problem is more, it just looks disorganized and disjointed. Like, they don't look like, yeah. Like it's the rotations don't look right. And the, you know, the, it, it just, I, I don't know. And I, again, I'm not in a, I, I've, I've never sat in a coach's pregame meeting. Like, I don't know what that looks like. I'm not going to pretend I do, but it feels like some of it could be streamlined. Some of it could be cleaned up and there would be a, okay, this is what we're looking at in these scenarios. This is who we want on the field. Like, again, it's not going to be perfect. Again, I I understand it's real time stuff's happening. You know, as Brent would say, bullets are flying. Like I get it that that it's not going to be ideal all the time. But it feels like there are just times when you're like, why is this so hard? Why is it so hard to get the right personnel for the right moment? Just think back to the Texas game and the final drive and what everybody to a man said after the game uh, in terms of how they executed on that drive. It was because there was a comfort within what they were doing. They had practiced it all week. They had that basically scripted down to a T of what they wanted to do. And it just seems like you're right, Josh. Like We've talked about that on radio this week, how – Everything that they do offensively, it just seems chaotic. It doesn't seem like everybody's on the on the same page. And I know that just that's hard. not the case. I know it's not the case because I we sit there and watch them go through that stuff Monday through you know Tuesday or now just Mondays when we go to do post practice. Yeah, it, it, again, it, it's just one of those things. And guys, I will say in the immediate aftermath of that game. I was on the corner. I was like, guys, I, I think the defense is getting too much of a pass here. Going back and watching that game, that defense played their ass off. They got left on the field a long friggin' time. There was, and that was part of it too. Like they'd make a big player, they'd get that fourth down stop, and then suddenly Oklahoma's, you know, got to deal with the the ball coming right back at them. You know, like just okay, three and out, or Tawi Walker on four straight run plays, and just. Uh, you know, and I, and again, at the same time, there has to be some allowance. The the Macari Vickers call changed 
that whole game. I think if that call's not made, OU's in pretty good shape there. But Josh, it's it's amazing to me the spots that OU's been put in defensively, whether it be the Marcus Stripling uh, fumble in Kansas that gives Kansas a short field, or last week against Oklahoma State. After you give up, a, I think it was 14, 15, 16 play, 97-yard drive, one snap later, you're right back onto the field. They held them to field goals both times when easily late in the fourth quarter of those games, in reality, because of the offense or because of turnovers, oh, you should have been down two scores. Guys, I'd be interested to hear what both of you think because I've been thinking about this a little bit over the week. I When you watch that defense... I see a lot of resolve. I see them kind of finding a way to get through trouble spots, like Eddie's just talking about. Like, a bad moment, okay, we're going to find a way through it. You see Oklahoma lose five yards, you can almost guarantee they're not going to get the first down. Like, it's like their heads go down, everything looks wrong. It just, it's weird. Like, I, and is it people keep trying to push that on Brent? And I'm like, I'm watching the defense, and the defense is doing all these things. Their, their mindset is great. They're clearly, just battling however they need to 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 get a result because and look at the time of possession in that That game touchdown look at the time of possession in that game early especially it was like 13 to 5 at some point or something like that well and they're not helping themselves because they try to go fast and then all of a sudden you have a 50 second uh series and they're having to punt the ball back but like is it looking too deep to say that they trust their coaches to put them in the right spots the defense as opposed to the other side of the ball I mean, I think that's probably a little too deep to look into it, but I mean, I, it's worth at least throwing out there. You wonder a little bit because you know you heard Brent talk about last year. You'd get guys that were what did, he didn't call it grabby. What did he call it? like just when they were trying to do too much? They were trying to do what was beyond their their assignment. Instead of their, doing their, their job, plan. they were trying to cover up and do other people's jobs for them, basically. Yeah, when he just needed and, all eleven guys to be doing their job. Exactly, because that offense, guys, when they were when they got out of their own damn way, they moved the ball all day. What they could run the that's the somebody brought this up, and it's it's again, it's a guy I gave credit to last week, and he brought it up in board chat. J. Wool thirteen, and he's like, the offense finally has a run game. They have finally found a semblance of a run game that's fairly consistent. They've got two backs that are that have done well over the last couple of weeks, and now they're passing like. Now they don't seem to have an identity. It's like they can't, like we've talked about over and over, they can't live with prosperity. Is it just a coincidence that it seems like the run game settling in along with a offensive line that has five guys? And a lot of gap scheme, a lot of players. Well, I, lot that's of not that a coincidence. It, they they just uh-uh. block it better. They, they play better when they do that. And how you wouldn't yep. continue to just go back to that repeatedly is just, it's, that's where you start talking like, do they need to make a move at offensive coordinator if you can't stick to yep. something? That That's my biggest issue is that it's this desire to shove this square peg into a round hole when clearly they can run gap and they look super comfortable. Guys, Caden Green looks like a future monster, and I don't know how they're going to get him away from the guard position because him pulling on some of that stuff, he is a killer out there on the edge. All right. Uh, look, it's going to continue, and, and this week Jeff Lebby's going to get you know graded all over again by the fan base. And uh, I do think that there is one thing that we ha- we need to touch on uh, that we haven't really talked about much of the week. It's kind of not that it's gone overlooked, but I just I, I stepped away from that game, and my main thought was, my God, like you don't have Danny Stutzman on defense. And he is replaced by a guy that's yo know, young, and he leads both teams in tackles with it. Like, if OU wins that game, Kip Lewis is Big Twelve Defensive Player of the Week. I mean, hundred percent. They the the should guy that anyway. was named he should have been anyway because the guy that was named was playing for Oklahoma State on the other side. Uh, it, it you know, it's kind of like Stutzman not being on the Budkus semifinalist list. Like nobody's getting any credit there, but. My God, I mean, here's and here's the question, Josh, because this is what everybody's posing. What do you do? What do you do with Kip Lewis moving forward? Uh, you've got Jaron Canick, and and I said this before. Like to me, Jaron Canick's season looks a lot like Danny Stutzman's season did last year, probably a little bit better, because there were some times when Danny Stutzman 
just you remember that Baylor game we talked about that mm-hmm. like he just mm-hmm. he just ran through the wrong gap and, and just left his gap wide open at times like you would see that kind of stuff I'm not really seeing that kind of mistakes by Jaron Canick maybe you know just not being in the right place not making the tackle uh not being in position to make a tackle uh I mean I'm not on the bench Canick for Kip Lewis train because really I think I think Kip Lewis I don't know. I mean, it's it's a can. I don't know. I don't have an answer really. I don't know what you think should happen. If they feel like Danny Stutzman can move to Mike, I move Danny Stutzman to Mike tomorrow, and Kip Lewis is my starting will. Like I, guys, he he makes mistakes. I'm not saying he doesn't. When all year has Jaron Canick looked like that? At any point this year, and I get That's that fair. Danny Stutzman moves to Mike. He may not be as effective. I understand. But he's going to be better than Jaron Canick, or I guess he is. The distance between him and Jaron Canick is smaller than the distance between Kip Lewis and Jaron Canick, and what I'm seeing. So, I, I again, I, I think that puts probably two of your three or four best defenders on the field at the same time. Like I, I'm just not going to let that go to waste because I might hurt somebody's feelings. Like I, I, I think it can be good for Jaron Canick to have a little time. Sit over there, see it, talk to Brent while he's seeing it. Just learn what he's, you know, okay, this is what we should be keying on. This is what we should be looking at. And again, if, if Kip misses it, okay, fine. But guys, I'm not opposed to Kobe Lewis, uh, Kobe McKenzie and Kip Lewis being your starting linebackers going forward. Like, What if you just I, rotate? I, I think, I think yeah, Danny's and that's fine. Week. What's that? I think Danny's playing this week. I mean, if he's healthy enough, you need him on the field. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Um I guys, that's the thing. Like you look at that defense that wasn't bad against Oklahoma State and I mean really did a bang up job with Ollie Gordon. Like, I mean, I, if you'd have told me that was the performance OSU was gonna get out of Ollie Gordon, I said it last week. I didn't think there was any way OSU could win that game. Alan Bowman playing out of his freaking mind, I did not have on my bingo card. <laughs> um Well so, so what happens when you don't really cover receivers when you when you're playing man to man. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and some of that is Oklahoma was just beat up at corner. Like, you get it. But even, I mean, they, they got a hold of Woody a couple of times. And, you know. Um, it, it's also oh, crazy. Rash- it's also crazy, though, in talking about, like, what Casey Dunn's done with Oklahoma State offensively is I think the general thought is they simplified a lot of stuff. All of a sudden, that thing gets moving. Like, how Oklahoma's offense coordinator can't just look in the mirror and say, let's do the simple stuff first, and then we'll maybe get into running a uh, ill-timed reverse led by the running back catching a snap. Like, it, 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 it just, I'm not even mad anymore. It's just like, what the f*** are you doing? I mean, when's the only time OSU looked out of sorts on offense? When, when they, they did that stupid, stupid trick play, yeah. Ollie Gordon throw. Like, you know, like, they got too complicated. Like, what are you, what are you doing here, guys? You're moving the ball. Alan Bowman slinging it all over the yard, like just and <laughs> and made good decisions. Didn't put the ball in bad spots. Like he didn't put it in danger. Even on that that second to last OSU drive, I mean their last real drive, he has that second down and he throws it out of bounds. You're like, oh, I kind of wish you to, you know, throw it at somebody's chest and let the guy just fall down. But at least he's not putting it in harm's way. If you just looked at the box score, like the play by play in the fourth quarter of the last two weeks and seen what Oklahoma's done defensively. Uh, forcing three turnovers, like the general thought, I think would be what? How many? How many did OU ended up winning by? Like they they had to have won by two touchdowns, right? It's like no, they they lost both games. The Billy Bowman pick in Stillwater, really good football teams. And OU's not a really good football team, but just a good football team pays that off in some regard. Yeah, I mean, and Jesus and- Christ, MAC teams are doing that on Tuesday night. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> they did watching night. as intently as you are. Uh, had a really good night. Yeah, did you? Well, good. Uh, maybe you could float George some money for his car. Uh, yeah, I mean, we would, but he's suspended by Eskridge right now, so he okay. can't. Yeah, I see. Uh, jo- and here's something. That I know Eddie and I talked about this the other day, Josh. Like, And, and maybe it was you and, and, and maybe it was all of us just sitting in the conference room. But like, one of the things, like, you can be critical of Oklahoma's defense – but you have to remember one thing. This is a team that, you know, I when was the last time that this team put another offense 
in a desperation mode. Yeah, we were talking about that in the conference room. Yeah, like with Iowa State, they get up big and they have to start throwing it all over the place to try and catch up. OU gets a bunch of interceptions. When you're playing behind or even the entire game, like Cincinnati's probably the last time maybe uh, where they could really take advantage of Emory Jones. Um, but and that was and that was like late fourth quarter too because that game was within you know it, yeah it wasn't over in the middle right. of the third he didn't have to start throwing until the fourth yeah, yeah. Uh, but like Josh it's the thing like this is a defense and people can sit and say well they're not, they're not playing well because they're not getting as many turnovers now well they're not exactly playing in games like they were earlier in the season where they're up by fourteen or they're up by twenty one and the other team has to start throwing the ball around and getting out of the comfort zone of their offense. Like Kansas, like you put Jason Bean in a situation where he's, and he threw a lot, I know, but if you take all the misdirection and the run, you know, uh, stuff out of the game with Kansas, you're going to be able to lock in on Jason Bean. You're going to be able to intercept some passes. They couldn't do that because they were behind or, or, you know, neck and neck with Kansas the entire game. Both teams pretty much got to stick to their offensive game plans, even though OU's wasn't very good. Yeah, I mean, and the... I mean, I guess I would say the second half of Iowa State, Iowa State largely, you know, they were down by 20 at half. Like right. they had to, they had to get, more, but they also had a freshman quarterback that they were trying not to, okay, let's not make this Rock into over. a snowball and we just really fall up, roll, really fall apart. Um, but I, I mean, you're right. Like they've, because you don't have an offense that's making the opposing defense pay for its mistakes, uh, at least not as often as it should. Then you're you're getting a lot of back and forth games. And Texas, you get it. Like Texas is a really good team too. There, that was always going to be tooth and nail, like all the way to the end. But these these other games, like there are so many points in both UCF Kansas or and all three of UCF Kansas and Oklahoma State. The opportunity was there to put them to bed, and they just didn't do it. And when you let a let a team hang around and start believing in it, we all know, guys, the pressure mounts on you because you're the favorite. And then simultaneously, they start thinking they've actually got a chance to win the game. Well, and conversely, your defense not only is getting that advantage, but <laughs> you're also out there, you know, holding teams to field goals after you've had a turnover inside, you know, the red zone. And, you know, or you go out and you stuff, you know, a fourth and one play, uh, you know, inside the five yard line. And then your offense goes out and has a three and out, and you're right back on the field. It's mm-hmm. it's just not fair what the offense has done to this defense at times. For me to sit it's, here and judge it and say, you know, Brent shouldn't be doing this, or uh, you know, they're not playing as well, or they're getting run down. Yeah, they're getting run down. They're on the field all the fucking time. The one thing that I yeah. was slightly disappointed at in the Oklahoma State game from a defensive perspective, I thought that they were going to get more pressure on Allen Bowman, and I understand in the first half. They're get that ball was getting out quick. There's only so much you can do, and especially when they're doing the RPO stuff. But it seemed like in the second half, there were opportunities to get after them a little bit, and they just didn't. They didn't win enough battles up front. Well, but also, you realize, I mean, like the first quarter, he was 12 of 14. The rest of the game, he was pretty, pretty pedestrian. Right. And when they did get pressure on him, and, and basically all he would do would flee the pocket and just throw it out yeah. of bounds. I mean, so that, you know, those aren't sacks, but that's, you know, that's You're part of the pressure. game that they got. Yeah, yeah. I'll give him that. Well, and I think OSU also was doing lots of six, seven man protections. Sure. Like they they were keeping that away from him. And I think that's what Oklahoma finally said. Like we're going to stop running these blitzes and leaving our guys on islands. They they went very how do you how do you stop Lincoln Riley? Rush three, drop eight. Like yeah, I mean they they were dropping all over the place. And then oh, Bowman had nowhere to go with the ball because Oklahoma did a nice job in its drops. Well, and that's why OU's and run had get, three that, guys out on routes, and that's why Sachuk had the big run because Oklahoma State was daring them to run the ball early. Mm-hmm. All right, well, um, <laughs> that I think did we get the bedlam out of our system now? I think it's I think yeah, we're good to I move mean, on. There's only so much you can talk about, I know. but I it, it still we comes have Josh all the and way. I really talk sure. Really, so. No, I, I'm saying though, like just in terms of we can keep going round and round, but it comes down to they still win that football game if you cut down on the penalties and you eliminate the turnovers. The turnovers were as detrimental as it can get. And that seems like that is a big thing for Oklahoma over the last two weeks is they're giving up the ball on drives. And it's, I think the most agonizing thing about it 
it doesn't seem like they're turning the ball over as much as they're just giving the ball away. Yeah. Yeah. You, you get it if a guy puts a football on his helmet on a football. Like that's just going to happen sometimes. Sure. But and sometimes just misplay snaps and that stuff. That that's that's self inflicted wounds. Yeah. Sometimes you're going to throw into double coverage and it's going to get picked. It was you know it was interesting talking to the dump throw to Dylan Gabriel this week. He he met with the media, went like 24 minutes. Um, and you know it was a lot of just chit chatting toward the end. He was talking about surfing and you know his his. Like just living in Hawaii and the life and stuff, and uh, but it did start out, you know, kind of melancholy. Like, you know, I don't know if George asked him, it, but yeah, George asked him if they were going to be able to get it turned around. He's like, I don't know. We'll see Saturday. Like, we'll see Saturday. Like, yeah, I mean, he's like, I'm sick of the talk. Basically, yeah, I want to see the team do it. Yeah, 100. percent They know that guys. I, they, I would say Drake oh, Stoops probably fired me up more than anybody. Yeah, the the comment about like why he plays football was I mean that's as Stoopsonian as it could possibly it get. It could have it's, been coming out of Bob Stoops. Yeah, I mean, it was the video it was, makes it, was, it even better because it like his mannerisms, everything about it, it's like that's Bob. When he said what when he looks to his left hard like that, I'm like Jesus, that's Bob. Like I mean, like that was <laughs> exactly who that who, looked like. Who's saying that? Well, I've, the funny, I've heard Bob uh-huh. say that before. The funny thing is, and I know you know it's. After the game, and even now, you know, you just look at the thread titles on Sooner Scoop, and it's like a minefield of, oh shit, I don't want to get involved in that. Um, but I really like last night. I get home. Um, we Eddie and I were up here late. We had somebody coming by the office, and we were talking to, and like I'm going into my driveway, like pulling into my driveway. It's probably eight thirty, and I'm thinking to myself, like, okay, what do we got to do tomorrow? We got to do the pod eleven. Um, and then I'm like, holy shit, is it really Wednesday already? Like, this, there's three games left. Like, all the crap that we've all been through, all this, all the posts that you guys have made, all the podcasts that you've listened to, like, here we are, nine games into a season, and it seems like it just started yesterday. And, like, when you hear Drake Stoop say that about, you know, they work for this and, you know, nothing's, you know, they have something to play for, it's like, well, yeah, we're going to keep writing and we're going to keep doing YouTube videos. We're going to keep doing podcasts. And like, we're not going anywhere. We're still in this thing. And it's just like, just just get off your asses and let's see what happens in these last three games. I mean, this is this is still a season that everybody was saying, if it's 10 and 2, 9 and 3, and not you know another losing season, that's progress. But I think what's happened, guys, is that Texas game just reset everyone's expectations, and sure. you just can't go back now. Well, it, it, but the, you should be able to have some perspective and look back and say, you know what? They beat West Virginia. They went out. This is still going to be a good season. I'm not. I'm not going like the people that go on the message boards. You know, I'm done with OU football this year. I'll come back next year. Like, no, you're not. You're not. No, no self-respecting OU fan is going to sit there and say, I'm done watching this team. Well, I mean, you can't you, say that. And, and then, you're a liar if you do say you, it. You can't say that and then, you know, somehow, some way, uh, Kansas State beats Kansas, Texas loses, you know, whatever. Iowa State. To Iowa State, and then OU and OSU uh, went out, and they're playing in Arlington for the Big 12 Championship. There is still a shot You can't, you can't jump back on the train then. <laughs> the train's already left the station. Well, I don't think that's going to happen, well, but I don't know if they're the going to win Saturday. There. Yeah, they, they're not... They haven't been taken off life support yet. Guys, I mean, th- that's one of those things, and I, I do. I always am amused when people say stuff like that because stuff that you can quit that easily doesn't make you that mad. Like, yeah. it, uh, it's, you know, the girl you cared about in high school, you, you didn't, like, you don't get over it because you did care about it. The ones you don't care about the ones you forget about. Like, that. that's... That's the way that goes. So I, I, I just I never understand the oh I'm done. No, you're not. Like you're just blowing off steam, and I get it. But it's and the, and it's just. I mean, guys, there, there's like we can see the numbers. There's still plenty of people reading and doing and interacting with all the stuff we're doing. So with that said, um, that there's there's plenty of room and I think allowance to be mad about how this has gone over the last two weeks because you are as shitty as they've played over the last two weeks. You were literally a couple plays away from being nine and zero, and I think the narrative out there is this is a team of destiny, basically, even despite all of their flaws. 
And I, again, like we talked about it, guys. I, I I think we all agreed after Texas. Like you can't move the goalpost. You can't change what this team is. But this team was limited. Like I I, I thought before the season, nine or three, nine and three or ten and two was where this team should be. They're still on course for that. That can still absolutely happen. You go ten and two, and then either go to the Big Twelve Championship or go play in a, a good bowl because we know they're going to want to put OU in the best possible bowl they can. They'd almost certainly be the number two entry in that scenario. I mean, number two or number three, you know, kind of depending on what happens with Texas. But there is, there's just no, there's no way that you can look at what's happened and not feel like, yeah, this got away from them. Like th- this could have been so much more than it is. But guys, look at the roster. Look at, look at, I, I keep talking about, look at the upperclassmen. How many really high-end draft picks are there in that junior and senior class? There's very, very few. Yeah. You look at Georgia. You look at Michigan. You look even at Florida State, Kerry. I know you've paid close attention. Um, <laughs> there are plenty on all those teams. like that, And that's how you win championships. So, again, I, I wonder if it would have been more of the same. Oh, you go to the playoff and just gets overwhelmed by better teams. Uh, by the way, I want to remind you guys, DeadSoxy.com, a uh, great partner of uh, Sooner Scoop and uh, working on our unofficial 40 uh, line right now. So uh, stay tuned for that one. But go to go to DeadSoxy.com, uh, type in that promo code SCOOP, and you'll get 25% off your entire order. That, that, that's it. Like, your order, 25% off. Uh, go check out the uh, the new athletic uh, socks the uh, in the uh, team colorways. Uh, they've got all kinds of new uh, crimson socks on the website for you. I've told you guys this before. Just amazing customer service. Uh, I know I can say without question now everyone in the office has them because they just sent us a big bundle of no-shows. I'm trying to wash them instead of just grabbing ones, new ones and wearing them until they get dirty. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to get the, uh, the bag. You get this bag that you put them in. It's a washable bag, so all your no-shows will stay together and you won't lose them because I wear mismatched pairs all the time because I'm a mess uh, and I need to do laundry right now. But anyway, deadsoxy.com. Go check them out. Uh, Just type in uh, Team Colorways. Go check out the Crimson Collection. Uh, They've still got the Maker Bayfields out there. Uh, But the all-new collection is really cool. Uh, You can get all four of them uh, all together. Uh, They've still got the Wagon Socks as well. Those are actually on sale right now for just 14 bucks. So Go to deadsoxy.com, D-E-A-D-S-O-X-Y.com. Use that promo code SCOOP. Get 25% off your entire order. By the way, speaking of uh, the end of the season, uh, where are we on an Alamo Bowl featuring Oklahoma and USC? Kind of blah. Do you think Lincoln Riley would show up to any of the press conferences or he'd just take the hit? No, he, I mean, he would show up to it. I think, I think with he the might... comments that are coming out of Los Angeles in the uh, aftermath of the... Alex Grinch firing. Mm-hmm. I guess we've basically come to find out that he is like all of our fears were confirmed. He's a sociopath. Yeah, that's some weird stuff. I'm worried. I I said it in December of 21. I'm worried about Caitlin and the girls. Oh I was I was way ahead of this for a long time. I mean, his uh, comments guys, on Grinch and running a good defense at Oklahoma. Yeah, he has to know how insane that it's like he thought that no one like in this day and age people don't have the internet or something like you can't go and look at statistics or anything like that anytime you want yeah it it was like it was like the 1940s and he was coaching at minnesota in his previous (laughs) life and no one no one on the west coast knew anything about big 10 football back then like did they make him go out there like on a covered wagon or did he take a plane? I think he took a plane. I think you were there when they took I off. I mean, I would he chalk... Knows technology it, exists, right? I would chalk it up to just some, uh, you know, coastal elite if I didn't already know that he's from Mulshoe, Texas. Yeah. Like, he thinks he's... He, he thinks he's smarter than everybody else. It's it's really kind of amazing that people just let him get away with it. It's It's kind of amazing that... He's able to stand up, unless it's like just a big bit. Maybe it's a big goof to him. He, he might be that weird. Like, how far can I push my bullshit before anyone was actually going to call me on it? Yeah. I think there's one thing we know, though. If OU played USC in a bowl game, Caleb Williams would not be a participant. I 
would oh. think not. He'll be getting ready for the draft. And what if he came out? I would like the, OU by a considerable margin in that game because they're not going to have the only guy that matters on their roster. What if, uh, yeah, I mean, what if he came out with his uh, statement saying he was going to withdraw from the bowl game and say, like, I only play bowl games for Oklahoma? I mean, it would be amazing <laughs> if he doesn't play in the bowl game. The only head coach that will have won a bowl game with Caleb Williams is Bob Stoops. Yeah. How about that? That's kind of crazy. God, talk about some trivia 20 years from now. A Heisman Trophy winner. Who, what, yeah, that would be a great trivia question. Heisman Trophy, 2022 Heisman Trophy winner Caleb Williams won one bowl game in his entire career. Who was the head coach? Who was the head coach? It's crazy. Because I think most people would think, I bet you, Brent Venables. I bet you even now, like 20% of college football fans would get that right. And, you know, like obviously the OU fan base would remember, but anybody outside of OU and probably I bet you even Oregon people don't remember it that way that well. I know. I don't think anybody watches like the stuff that built America. They had the one on Trivial Pursuit, like how it got invented. That was fantastic. I could see that being. Hmm. Did you have the Trivial Pursuit Sports Edition growing up? No, I had the regular one, and I, I did that's why I never got into it because I would try to play it when I was like ten, and it was these massively difficult questions. I was like, F- <laughs> "That game, I'd never want to play that." Yeah, it was one of those things. Like it was very shiny and weird, and like you know, you didn't really have these pies that you put together, but you did, you wanted to put one together, and then you read the got the first question, and you're like F- this game. <laughs> I'm gonna go play Boggle. <laughs> Hell with this. Uh, no, that'd be a great trivia pursuit question in the future, though. Um, Okay, uh, Josh, I mean, I, I feel bad because we're not really going to talk about West Virginia that much, um, but I think we just needed to get this last bedlam out of our system. We'll move forward. The, the game day preview is coming up. Uh, we're actually going to talk to Gabe Eichard this week because there's really no one that's not working for a competitor that we could get that's under the age of 80. I think that Let's be honest. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the pool of reporters to pick from for West Virginia – uh, I think most of their talents are being displayed over at Heinz Field covering the Steelers. Yeah. And, and not you know, to be derogatory about the West Virginia people. And we always had people. a good relationship with, you know, um, Mr. Cumming, Cummins. Keenan Cummings. Keenan, yeah, Keenan, good yeah, guy over at the rival over site. Over at rival site, West Virginia. Um, but, you know. Um, I think people would rather hear about Oklahoma's problems yeah but i mean gabe you know he prepares for the games like he watches film and all 22 and that stuff to prepare for the broadcast so it'll be good to catch up with him we've had teddy on recently uh but josh i I know we had a pretty extensive recruiting report on monday uh with a lot of video but i mean img went out there uh i think you know we were we were talking about this yesterday eddie like the least football name Andrew Marsh sounds like someone that covers, uh, you know, a NBA team like in Minnesota. Like it doesn't sound like a, a top 100 wide receiver or a top, maybe a the top overall wide receiver in the 2025 class. Yeah, and and you hear him talk, and he is this really soft spoken, you know, not not like this alpha dog guy you would think, but then you watch him play. And I, again, I, I talked about it on the, um, the recruiting uh, report we did earlier this week, guys, he's just nasty. Like, I mean, like, I don't care if you're talking about as a receiver and I mean, he's taking short stuff and breaking tackles or, you know, going over the top or making leaping catches, like any, any way that you want to throw that kid, the ball, he'll make a play for you and, and probably do something with it after the catch. But, it's his, you know, like we've talked a lot this year about how much the blocking has really improved under Emmett Jones. I don't know, like Emmett Jones is going to be like, just go be you, dude. Like, just go go out there and just kill some people. And he may actually have to pull him back a little bit because Eddie and I talked about it on Monday. That poor kid from Katie Morton Ranch wanted no more of Andrew Marsh. Like they ended up sw- that's like flipping their corners because they had a real good one. The kid that's committed to Minnesota on the other side, and they were like this. This poor kid's like, we're going to have to get him counseling after this game's over if this continues. He got bullied. I mean, it, yeah. it, there are school districts within the United States of America that would probably kick him out of school because he was so mean to this kid. And not just <laughs> from a physical standpoint, uh, he caught everything. That that catch and run that he has, I think it's his third or fourth touchdown in a five-touchdown night. 
to catch the ball and then break the amount of tackles. It was it was CD Lamb esque at the Cotton Bowl. There is there's some Lamb to his game. Like I mean, because he is he's so long. He like I said the other day, he's got huge hands. He catches everything that's close to him, and. You know, you throw in that, and then, like I said, he's got some speed to separate. He's very adept as a route runner. Um, you know, one of these guys that really works on it year-round, does a lot of seven-on-seven, seven, works with trainers. You know, Andrew Marsh is, is a – as well as – you know, well-refined as you could be for a high school junior receiver. Very, very good. He, he's – to me, he's a no-doubt. Like, once he arrives on campus, he'll be part of the wide receiver rotation almost anywhere he goes. In your trip to IMG, it seemed like in the tape that you sent back – and I don't know if this is fair to say, I was more interested in the highlights from Jaden Jackson, but the interview from David Stone. And that's not to say that David Stone didn't have a really good night. Yeah, David, I mean, David's a five-star. David did what you expected David to do. Like, he dominated. He had some huge plays. He IMG moves him around all over the offensive, uh, excuse me, the defensive line. But when you watch, um, you know, you, you watch that interview, any of the talk of, oh, you know, Alabama's calling him or Miami's still trying or, you know, I, I don't see how you could watch that interview and be worried about David Stone. Like, that, that's a kid using terms like we and us and, you know, just, just got to get this right. And, you know, he, he was very, very positive about Oklahoma. And I just, I, again, I, I think anybody that had any concerns, I really feel like that interview, if you haven't watched it, uh, you know, go check it out on the Sooner Scoop editorial page. Um, is absolutely, uh, excuse me, on YouTube. Um, th that should put it a lot to rest. And David, David and I go way back. I've known him since you know, basically the start of his, you know, high school, not just his high school career, but his, you know, first day of high school. I was there to see him the spring going into his freshman year. So he's a kid I've known for a long time. Um, and, you know, he comes off very easy and, you know, easy to talk to. But to flip to Jaden Jackson, just a, uh, a guy that I'd never had a chance to see before. I liked the tape and seeing what some, you know, um, have said about him. It matches up very physical, powerful run defender kind of reminds me of like, a like an Isaiah co type of player, very, very strong point of attack, but has some ability to get underneath a block, going to create some pressure. Um, I, I was, I was very impressed, and I know at on three, they've got him as a three-star, but he's a four-star player to me. I don't think there's a lot of doubt in my mind. Is he so massive like that his pants shred at the knees? Like It looked like he <laughs> needed to have two pairs of pants like sewed together to fit his body. Uh, his, it, now, like we talked about on Monday, it was senior night there at IMG, and his family... They're big people. Like yeah. he, Jaden, J Jaden comes by that very naturally. H his dad's a big guy. Like th his family, they are. Th th there was never any hope of him being a wide receiver. That man was going to be big <laughs> from the time he was born. Big dude. He looked good. Um, this weekend, uh, you've put it out there already. Grant Bricks is coming to town. Is this like a make or break weekend for OU? Like if if he doesn't. If he comes to Norman, takes his visit, and then doesn't commit in, say, a week's time, does that set off alarm bells for you? I think it would. I, I, I To me, this is – and I, I don't so much mean that, like, I expect him to pick OU if he comes this weekend. I just think at, this almost has to be the last visit. Like, I, I don't – I've not heard any talk about a Kansas State trip. I think the talk for a long time that the, about this being between OU and Nebraska, which is a belief that both staffs have had for quite some time now. Um, there's been a lot of K State talk from K State people, but I just I haven't heard it as much as of late. Um, I think this is this is kind of the final check. I could see him going home, sitting down with his parents, talking things over, and then making his choice. Um, I. Could something happen this weekend? Sure, it's possible. Um, I don't think it's overly likely because that's not really the way he's handled stuff. It's been, and again, with Grant Bricks, it wouldn't shock me if he says nothing between now and signing day and kind of like pulls an Arch Manning and just, oh, hey, there went my letter of intent and the school announces his commitment, you know, whether it's Nebraska or Oklahoma. So I, I, if, I, I guess I would say it this way. If he makes a decision in the next, 
10 days, I think that's very good news for Oklahoma. If he doesn't, you're right back to where we've been, where you're just kind of guessing what Grant Bricks is thinking. Which has been quite a celebration over the last month and a half, it seems like, with this kid. Every time you think you have a read on him, some he'll do something else. And you're like, well, I didn't see that. I mean, again, I, I thought the Nebraska truck move, I was like, well, that's desperation. That's them trying to slow this all down. And then you heard the, how the well the visit went from our you know our, our guys at uh, our Nebraska site, Sean Callahan and all those guys. They were very confident that, that visit went very well. Uh, I think he gave a lot of people a really positive impression of where he was with Nebraska. And then almost immediately I started hearing, but don't go to sleep. He may show up at Oklahoma and West Virginia. And, you know, you kind of wondered, and Grant's made some changes to his plans through the last six months. I mean, we've all seen that evolve over, you know, various points of time. And now to watch him, you know, that we've been able to confirm he will be coming down. He's going to make that trip. That's just huge for Oklahoma. And I, I, I've got to take that as a good sign. OU's getting the last, what, what I assume will be the last visit. And if that's the case, I, that usually ends up well in a race like this. Nebraska fans have to be so pissed. Like if Oklahoma gets him, it's like they lose everyone to Oklahoma. I, the the only guy on that roster I can remember them flat out losing to Nebraska is a kid named Turner Corcoran from Kansas that picked Nebraska several years ago. Another offensive lineman, um, which was I mean then was a uh, at least with Matt Rule I'm like I can see buying into who Matt Rule is and what he's about and that kind of stuff. But then you were like I don't know what you're buying into. I don't know what it is you're looking at. Okay, so a uh, six o'clock kickoff. Does that does that get, is Oklahoma like scrambling to get extra guys to come in this weekend, uh, knowing that they have a little bit more time and maybe they get some guys from out of state to fly in on Saturday? Yeah, I think you're going to see um, several guys, you know, like a bigger list. Because uh, there's all, I think at one point TCU was clearly going to be the, the kind of final big one. But you don't know when the kickoff time is going to be on that. TCU hasn't quite been what yeah. everybody thought they were going to be. We, we've known. So that changes the math. We've known on the TCU kickoff. It, it's been 11 a.m. for a while. Oh, has it? Crap. I yeah, just yeah. missed that. So that only aids it. But it's Thanksgiving weekend. It's the Friday after Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And asking kids mm -hmm. to not only leave Thanksgiving early, but spend your Black Friday in Norman for a game probably, you know, for people that it's a, it's a need to travel. It's a pain in the ass to travel on Thanksgiving. We've done that oh, before. God. Not as yeah. bad as Christmas yeah. so, when they, they cancel your flight. I don't know how I just missed that. But, yeah, so this is your last, obviously, your last home game that makes a lot of sense here. So uh, I think you will see several guys. I, I, I used to really check on Mondays and Tuesdays, and then I just saw too many guys that would – you know, either didn't know at that point or what they did know ended up changing. And so I'd have to check two or three times. You're like, I'll just wait. So this is about the time of the week where I really start going through and verifying who's going to be there, what, you know, what, what it looks like. But I would expect a good visit weekend. Um, you know, obviously Grant Bricks is huge. Um, you know, I, I would, because I, this is where you can even get guys, the guys from Houston, the guys from Kansas City, um, you know, Isaiah Mosey, Kamori Moore, some of those kind of guys. Uh, that maybe come down and you know I, I know o, OU fans will hear me say those two names from Lee Summit North and no I have not heard anything about <laughs> Williams Winery making another trip to Oklahoma I I just I don't think that's going to come together the way OU fans want it to but I mean they're going to keep shooting their shot it's kind of it's kind of like David Hicks last year like I I think the writing is on the wall but you know they're they're not going to give up on the chase Anything else uh, big recruiting wise that you're keeping Josh, an eye on her this weekend? Jordan Seaton, I know that that was another guy that was at IMG while you were down there. It just seems like OU's fighting an uphill battle there. Yeah, the the belief has been for a while that Colorado, Oregon, and Alabama have kind of separated. Obviously, Alabama at IMG, there's a considerable history there, and I that's talking to some people around that program. Um, I got the impression while I was down there that Alabama was going to be pretty tough to beat for him. So I, that's where I would definitely keep an eye. But Oregon, we know they're going to they're going to hit him with all the NIL they can throw at him, and that's that's always interesting. But um, 
I, I, I would be fairly surprised. I'm almost to the point of putting a prediction in for him to Alabama uh, on, on three. Anything else uh, do you want to hit on about recruiting before we get out of here? Um, I put in a new prediction in the class of 2025. It's in woke. Um, a uh, one of the you know top 15, 20 corners in the country, a kid named Kobe Sellers out of uh, Shadow Creek in uh, the Houston area that I had a chance to go see a few weeks ago. Jay Valai went and saw him last week uh, for their game, and I think there's just a real strong bond between him and uh, – not only Sellers himself and Jay Valai, but also his parents really clearly have a lot of affinity for Jay Valai. I think they feel like he's a guy they can kind of trust with, um, you know, more than just being a player. He, he's a guy they feel will, you know, help him grow into a man and that kind of thing. So um, I, I went ahead and put a prediction in. I, I, I really wanted to see how hard OU was ready to push for him and for Jay Valai to make that trip on Bedlam Week. It, it tells you that's a that's a priority target for them. Uh, there is uh, basketball being played right now, and uh, I know, Josh, hold on, I'm not going to go too deep into it, um, but we, we will schedule, when Bob is not trying to infect the entire office, uh, we will try and sk schedule, I think we want to maybe build a YouTube uh, show with Bob to, to talk hoops uh, from time to time, so look forward to figuring that out and we'll get that soon but yeah it's I, kind of a shame that bob wasn't here to be able to talk about you actually saw some basketball i mean eddie actually was there yeah it it was good i i think that they're going to be better bob would probably be able to talk about it a little bit more than i but javin mccollum looked really good at running the point for oklahoma i was uh kind of pleased to see the development with otega owe uh los Uzon are going to be obviously big parts of this team and i think there's a lot of wait and see as uh, you know, Oklahoma opens the season with the 30 point victory over Central Michigan, who's not very good. I think they were outside the uh, Ken Palm 300. So uh, they did what they needed to do against a really bad basketball team. They kind of beat the shit out of them, used a 25 4 run in the first half. And uh, we'll see. I, they, if nothing else, it looks like a basketball team. And I know that that's like kind of condescending, but uh, they're way more athletic than they have been. J Jalen Moore. The transfer from Georgia Tech looks like he could be uh, somebody off the bench. John Hughley looks good. Uh, the Pitt transfer, Oklahoma actually has a big man this year. And then, uh, you know, there's a host of guys like, whether it be a Rivaldo Suarez or uh, who am I thinking of? I'm leaving somebody out. This is where we need Bob. <laughs> uh, well, I have no help because all I did was watch Jenny Branchick's team. Yeah, they look good too. It'll come to me at probably the most inopportune time. So well, we'll see. I think the non-conference schedule, they should be able to rack up a bunch of wins. I know that like playing USC out in San Diego is going to be a big test. Playing Arkansas and Tulsa is going to be a big test. They have Providence at home. Uh, those are the types of games that I think will be real barometers as far as where this thing is at. But they look like they're better. So we'll see. Uh, yeah. And, and isn't, uh, I mean... USC, they've got two other guys besides Brawny that they brought in, right, that are big time? Yeah, the I, I forget the kid's name, but he tore up uh, Kansas State in the uh, season opener, and I think he's supposed to be a lottery pick. Wow. So they'll have their hands full. Uh, all right, um, it's Luke over, Norweather. Josh. You can Luke, breathe. Luke, Luke, Luke Norweather, Norweather looked really good, too. I think he's going to be a really good player for them. I just don't know if it's going to be like this year. He's going to play, obviously, but... I think he could be a really nice player in the SEC. The OSU transfer for Ginny's team, she looks really good. She had a good game the other day. They're an I mean, I think they're going to be a pretty good team. Yeah. It sucks that they uh, lose Liz Scott for the yeah. for the season uh, with a shoulder injury. Big player on the uh, NCAA tournament team a year ago. But they should be really good. They could shoot the rock. All right. West Virginia coming up this weekend. Uh, Six o'clock start, so it'll be a late night for us. But uh, we'll be here for the Eskridge Lexus postgame podcast as well. Josh, you want to stay up for that one, right? We, uh, we count you, you, in. you know that I will. I, I think you're talking about basketball, but I, I couldn't be sure. I, I, I no, we switch it. we're talking about the postgame podcast. You're, we, we got you on that one with the 6 o'clock start, right? You're going to stay up for that. Absolutely, of course. Okay. You, you guys, I mean, you know it. But <laughs> last week, I was ready. I told Tiffany as soon as that game ended, I was like, I'm going to end up on the podcast. I'm going to tell you now. And then nobody hit me up, and I was like, well, okay. They don't, they don't need me. And clearly... George and I would have been a toxic, toxic situation. That that would have been bad. Yeah. Uh, well, the suspension is over for George. Um, 
He'll be back uh, for the YouTube tomorrow. I think the punishment enough was having to buy a new alternator. Yeah, he sent the price, and I think he's getting ripped off, but he's got a battery included in there, too. But anyway, apparently the guy that that said he was a big fan of the YouTube show wasn't really a fan. Hey, man. Not giving a good Bill's got to get paid somehow. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, he, in YouTube's this economy. Like, he, he's like, this guy's big on YouTube. We're going to charge him a lot. Uh, all right, that's going to do it. I'm not going to get in trouble for the redneck voice now. Uh, that's going to do it. Appreciate it, Josh. Pretty appreciate it, Eddie. Uh, we'll be back all kinds of platforms, but definitely the Eskridge Lexus Postgame Podcast. I'm proud of uh, Eddie. He is now a mentor for George, and George is leaving crap in the door of his passenger sidecar, just like Eddie did for decades. I'm going to leave it there until I mine. pick him up to go to the airport next week to go to uh, Provo, and it'll still be there, and he can't get out until he removes it. I had uh, Red Bull stains on that door That's for when it was to- finally towed That's away. Just not even true. It's absolutely 100% accurate. It, it, it can't. Red Bull can't. Uh, well, then it was five energy stains. I don't know what it, it was. might have. Well, I, I don't even know about that because if, if Red Bull could stain, I think anybody that walked the halls of uh, 747 or took a lap would have had it all over their clothes for like years upon years. Eddie's DNA was in that car, too. Now, that might be a fact. That might be a fact. Not like semen or anything. That is so, but that is so concerning. I hope it wasn't I, I semen. I can't even get into that conversation. My DNA was there, but I was not. Just like Scott Peterson and the Lacey Peterson disappearance, <laughs> per se. If it happened. All right. No, it happened. <laughs> I just don't know if he did it. Oh, I thought you meant the DNA. He said he was fishing. All right. Uh... <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> All right, we have to get out of here uh, before this gets any worse. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back again. Uh, YouTube channel, check it out, youtube.com slash Soonerscoop. Also, go to Soonerscoop, sign up. It's just a dollar to try it out. Uh, We'd love to have you sign up uh, and uh, doing great work there as well. George and and Bob and Josh uh, giving you plenty of stuff, mountains of stuff online to check out. So so get all the latest. Stay caught up. Join the community. Uh, great place to be. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll be back next week. And this voice crack. Uh, for another edition of the Unofficial 40 Podcast right here on Soonerscoop.com.